is your body, brain, feelings, motivation, and whatnot. Your cortex is a late add-on in an evolutionary sense. You can do without a sherbet scoop of cortex and you wouldn't even notice it. I can take a sherbet with a uh, spoon and take out your cortex and you would not notice it. But if I took out a sherbet spoon of your basal ganglia, you'd be in trouble. You would, you would not be the same person. Uh, so in that sense, we share a, a lot of the same nuclear structure in the brain. He's, the, he's currently a, uh, he started his career at the University of Arizona as an assistant professor and then after that moved to Brown and uh, ascended the ranks rather quickly. He's the, um, um, he's the recipient of the Radboud Excellence Professorship in 2015. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then you can take those parameters and say, well, maybe you want to classify or you may do some kind of unsupervised where you don't really know who the patient or you really want to like the um, So there's many different ways that people have addressed high dimensional data sets. Um, so, on one side of this, it's sort of more communicative. You take some very high dimensional data uh, and often you can do different kinds of machine learning. Well, given a bunch of genetic data and a bunch of deep data, but on the other side, you may want to use from this high dimensional data set, you want to estimate some theoretical need for a new approach. For example, this here is using a computer model that's specified that we can use for and then, you don't have to do that on its own. So you can actually combine these approaches and say, well, and use the model as a way to summarize what we can for data that might be relevant for So this is just an example of one uh, case we have a But what this is showing is that there are different ways to distinguish two different groups of subjects. Let's say, based on some measure, so you have some threshold for saying, okay, this is a hit, the person is going to have to be And then you plot two parts of what you're And then we are super down the more like the 
realize that when we look at dopamine uh, patterns of activity, uh, in, in this case, this is a monkey. You train a monkey, you, gives it, you give it a stimulus. This is spikes from the dopamine neuron. You give it a reward, and you see dopamine neurons start increasing their firing rate. So, so far, it looks like the theory of dopamine is coding for reward is holding up pretty well. Uh, but then the trick is if you, if you train the monkey to sort of predict the reward, so you repeatedly present the stimulus, and it's followed by a reward after one second or two seconds or whatever, uh, then what you find is that when the stimulus is presented, you get this burst of dopamine. But when the reward is presented, nothing happens. Dopamine doesn't seem to care about it anymore, even though the monkey is just as happy and just likes the reward just as much, it's just as thirsty and so forth. Um, and similarly, you can present the stimulus and then play a trick on the monkey with hold of the reward, and you see there's actually uh, a depression in dopamine that's been very well characterized. Now, this, this finding is now held up across uh, monkeys and rats, mice, humans that are recorded intraoperatively. And so what this led to was a, a revolution in the theory of what dopamine does. So rather than it carrying a reward signal per se, it's thought to carry a reward prediction error signal when the reward is better than expected. Here, the monkey didn't predict the reward. And so a battery reward is happy, it gets a prediction error. Here, it did predict the reward, so there's no change. But the stimulus itself is a reward prediction error, because before the stimulus arrived, the monkey wasn't predicting any reward was going to happen. Then the stimulus says, oh, I'm going to get a reward in a second, so now my ex expected reward is higher than it was before. And when it expects a reward and doesn't get it, you actually get a negative reward prediction error, so things are worse than expected. and. Uh, and there's theories about how this uh, relates to computer science algorithms that can do fancy things in reinforcement learning. And that was sort of the, the deep connection that Reed and Peter Diane made based on um, uh, Wolfram Schultz's data that this signal relates to reward prediction errors and maybe it's related to reinforcement learning of some type. So how does that relate to people and decision making and so forth? Uh, so one question that, that we try to ask in, in my lab is, how do these dopamine reward prediction error signals? So the dopamine is made here in the midbrain, in the ventral tegmental area, and substantia nigra. And the most prominent place in the brain that dopamine signals are project to is the striatum. There is by far the most concentration of dopamine. There's also an important role of dopamine in the prefrontal cortex and some other regions. Uh, but for now, I'm going to focus on the striatum. Um, and uh, when you look at it in humans, you can look at uh, you can have humans do a task that gives them wins and losses in different areas of gambling or there's various uh, reward reinforcement learning tests. And you could say that on a given trial, they're going to get a positive reward prediction error sometimes, so they're, they're getting more money than they expect, but sometimes they get negative reward prediction error signals. And you could estimate that from a mathematical model that's fit to their behavior, that estimates the learning rates and so forth. And then you could ask, is there a part of the brain that seems to co vary with this prediction error signal? And what uh, pretty much everybody sees when they do that is that you get striatal activity. It's not always, uh, it's, it's very often in the ventral striatum, but sometimes it's the whole striatum. Uh, so that, that was shown by Sam McClure and Reed and, and lots of other people, and we've also seen these uh, signals. Um, so the question is, given that dopamine is made in the midbrain and projects to the striatum, why, what are these striatal signals doing? What are the reward prediction errors in the striatum doing? So for that, we have to ask the question of what does the striatum do as part of the brain network? It's part of a larger collection of nuclei called the basal ganglia. Um, and as a, I'm going to go through sort of a series of caricature cartoons to try to illustrate the theory of how we think that works. Uh, this is actually from a textbook. This is, the idea here is that uh, the cerebral cortex, or the, the frontal cortex in the case of uh, motor actions and other higher level decisions, may first narrow down the space of possible responses. So right now, you're in the room, you're watching a talk, you're thinking about a few things you can do. You're not considering every possible action you've ever done in the past. You're uh, sort of filtering it by saying, here are the possible responses in this context right now. And the main job of the basic thing is thought to sort of provide a break on all of those, stop those from getting executed. It wouldn't make sense to execute everything that you're considering doing at any one time. But to facilitate the, the most active response and suppress the competing responses. Now, we, uh, have argued that, and, and others too, that it's really not just doing this most active response thing, because then it would just be like, well, you can solve that problem in the cortex by itself, if I just use lateral inhibition and choose the most active one. But rather, the basic ganglia may somehow do some motivational computation that says, given these responses, their activity might matter a little bit, the ones that are most salient, 
But we also want to do some kind of cost-benefit analysis. So which one is the one that's going to most likely lead to a reward and least likely lead to a negative outcome? And we may care differentially about the cost versus benefits of those actions depending on different motivational states. So we think of this sort of cartoon here as uh, like a gating process. And those are going to kind of enables the cortex to do what it was already thinking about doing. Uh, and that the gating occurs in proportion to the relative probability of getting positive versus negative outcomes, which is linked through dopamine. Um, so here's another cartoon, uh, highly simplified schematic of the direct and indirect pathways of the basal ganglia that you may remember from anatomy textbooks, if you took more anatomy. Um, and uh, what you see here is that there's sort of representations of sensory states in the, in the cortex and, and potential movements and maybe some internal state in prefrontal cortex. In this diagram, I'm just showing a single circuit, but there's actually many of these loops. Uh, and then there's two main projection pathways that go outside of the striatum, different populations of neurons uh, that we refer to for simplicity as the go neurons and the no-go neurons. And that's because uh, the, the go pathway uh, has this sort of inhibitory effect on the output of the basal ganglia, which is itself inhibiting the thalamus and therefore inhibiting action, uh, cortical activity. And so that sort of double, double negative is called disinhibition, and that's what makes the system uh, a gated process. It sort of enables what the cortex is doing if it releases the inhibition on the thalamus. Uh, whereas the logo pathway essentially goes through one more uh, inhibitory synapse through the external segment of the globus pallidus, and also the, the subthalamic nucleus that I'm not drawing here, uh, and essentially has a counteracting effect. So if that pathway is active, it's thought to sort of inhibit movement. This is a very classical idea from the late 80s, that there's a direct and indirect pathway to basal ganglia that helps to explain various movement disorders and so forth. Um, there's been a lot of refinements of that model since then. And one of them is that, uh, well, first of all, these neurons have different receptors for dopamine. So the go neurons have D1 receptors, and, then, and the no-go neurons have D2 receptors. Uh, and the effect of dopamine on uh, activity and plasticity is different depending on that receptor. So just roughly, uh, more dopamine leads to more activity if, you're, if the neuron has a D1 receptor, but actually leads to less activity if the neuron has a D2 receptor. So that's why more dopamine is uh, related to sort of hyperlocomotion. People, well, there's a drug that's called speed, and sort of speed speeds people up. And low levels of dopamine leads to too much activity in the no-go pathway because there's no, no suppression of the no-go pathway, and that's what leads to symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Um, but this classic model makes it seem like it's just a push-pull thing. You're either going to act, you're not going to act, and dopamine promotes action or not. Um, but, so that's why this terminology is actually a bit misleading, even though I myself have been guilty of like, labeling those pathways, the go and no-go pathways in my models, and, and for purposes of simplicity, I realize I sort of regret that terminology because it implies this act versus not act. But really what, it, what the idea is in, in, in our models and some of the, the data that I'll talk about is that these pathways actually code for the, the benefits, the part, there's sort of positive evidence for a particular action leading to a good outcome. And there may be some positive evidence for a particular action leading to a negative outcome. And you have to sort of compare the evidence for and against each action, and you have to go out in parallel for all the actions that you're considering. So it's not just that you're activating one pathway or the other, you're, you're doing decision making across multiple options. And essentially it's a cost benefit analysis. Uh, and that actually produces, predicts that you should have activation of both pathways at the same time even as you're selecting an action because you're selecting some actions, suppressing others. Uh, and that phasic dopamine signals that come here from the midbrain here, uh, we think actually drive learning in this system to select the actions that have the most rewards and avoid the actions that have the least cost. And I'll try to illustrate that in a second. So if there is this case where there's a positive reward prediction error, so these dopamine neurons are spiking a lot, that leads to a transient increase in excitability of corticostriatal synapses uh, uh, onto D1 receptors. Not for this, in this cartoon, it makes it look like there's one neuron or one population of neurons, but it's really going to be for those neurons that already got excitatory glutamatergic input from the cortex. So they're the neurons that we're likely to have generated the action that produced the reward prediction error in the first place. Uh, and so there's often uh, what's referred to here as this three-factor Hebbian learning rule, which means you increase the synaptic rate, you increase the connections from the cortex to these neurons as a function of the presynaptic activity of the cortical state, so the sensory state that you're in in the world, the movement that you selected, and so forth, 
And the postsynaptic activity of the, the go neuron, so the, the neuron that generated the action and not other actions, and the level of dopamine. So if dopamine goes up, you learn more. And in, in the D2 pathway, there should be, according to this idea of sort of heavy and light learning, actually long-term depression. So you actually turn down the synaptic weights into the, into the no-go pathway if a, if a positive prediction error happens, because that's the opposite effect of dopamine there. Uh, conversely, uh, so originally this part was sort of predicted based on circumstantial evidence that we were building a model to fit across uh, a lot of rodent data and monkey data, but to actually predict effects of drugs in humans, which is simply that when there's a negative reward prediction error, that that should also lead to learning in this circuit, but by disinhibiting the D2 pathway. So the D2 pathway normally is inhibited even by low levels of, of dopamine, and now these neurons are actually more excitable. And so the neurons that are coding for the action that was just selected in the D2 pathway now are get a little bit more excited. So it's like having transient Parkinson's disease, but in a useful way because that increase in ex excitability is also associated, associated with an increase in plasticity. And that would allow the system to learn the costs of actions in a separate pathway from the pathway that learns the benefits. And I'm happy to talk later about why we think computationally that's actually a good thing to do rather than learn everything in one pathway. Uh, and, but that also predicts that, it, that this pathway is not involved just in suppressing actions, it's involved in learning to, about which actions are bad actions to select. Uh, and that if you have dopamine depletion too much, it may just feel like all these actions are negative, so it's as if you're getting negative reward prediction errors, and that might explain some aspects of Parkinson's disease. But it also says that it's not just an effect of excitability on, uh, uh, an effect of dopamine on performance, like don't move if you have low levels of dopamine, but there's a learning process that this, these weights into the D2 pathway will accumulate with experience. The more you do, you are in a low dopamine state, the more you, your system learns to avoid selecting those actions. So that can lead to a phenomenon of learned Parkinsonism that I'll talk about in a second. Uh, and although I said that originally this was based on a model that was trying to put together a bunch of pieces of data, there's now a lot more evidence for this kind of idea. So this is one piece of evidence from rodents. Uh, this is actually calcium imaging of specific D2 neurons in the striatum in a rat that just made a, a, a choice to go for a risky uh, option. So it could get one pellet of food, or it could get a 50% chance of getting two pellets of food. And so sometimes it doesn't get the food. And when it gets a zero outcome, you see that right after that loss, there's an increase in activity in the D2 neurons. And the degree to which that increase was seen uh, was predictive of the animal actually avoiding that risky choice on the next trial. And similarly, they, this same study, they applied optogenetics to stimulate those D2 neurons during the choice period and show that the more you stimulate D2 neurons, the more an animal is likely to avoid a risky choice and to instead select uh, a safe choice. But it's not about just inhibiting behavior, it's about inhibiting the actions that have the greatest cost. Um, so, so far I've shown you all cartoons of the circuitry. This is also a cartoon of the circuitry relative to the, the actual brain, but it's, a, it's our attempt to model it in uh, a neural network, and I'm not going to go into much detail here because that would be another talk to, to spend, uh, to elaborate on the dynamics, but this is, each one of these circles represents a neuron. Its height and color reflects its firing rate at a snapshot moment in time, and we can, we can model the rough physiological properties of neurons in the striatum, in the, the D1 and D2 pathways as separate from other parts of, of the circuit. And you can model the whole dynamics of the circuit as it experiences some sensory input and considers different possible responses. And you can model changes in dopamine reward prediction errors and how they change plasticity in these neurons and how they interact with other parts of the system. And so that allows us to sort of formalize ideas about that come from a lot of systems neuroscience but relates it to computation and makes us predictions about how different physiological signals will evolve during learning and decision-making tasks. Um, but the predictions that I'm going to tell you about now are mostly summarized by the previous slides in cartoon form, and then I'm later going to tell you about another part of this uh, circuit and just give you the, the gist of it. First, I, I wanted to just show one other data set that I didn't collect, but I think it was a particularly nice demonstration of this cl classical idea that you may have heard about, about the direct and indirect pathways being about to move or don't move. Uh, I think is often confounded because usually you're moving to do something that is rewarding and you're not moving to do something that you don't want. So this particular study by Eitri and Dudman in, in Nature last year was pretty nice in directly pitting against the, those two theories. 
what they did is they, they had a, a, a mouse uh, have to press a joystick. And sometimes when the mouse was, present, was pressing particularly fast, they would stimulate the D1 neurons. And then they would see what would happen on the future trials. And what they found was that if the mouse is responding fast and they stimulate the D1 neurons, then the velocity uh, actually goes up across trials. So it's like they're learning to go faster and faster. If you stimulate the D2 neurons after a fast action, they learn to go slower and slower. So, so far, that is consistent with the reinforcement learning theory, but it's also consistent with what a lot of people might have thought, that you know, you're essentially promoting action by speeding things up or s slowing things down. Uh, what I think was more interesting was when they did the opposite experiment. So they waited for the animal to do a particularly slow movement, which is like not acting a lot, and then they stimulate the D1 neurons. And what they find there is that if you stimulate during a slow velocity action, the animal is actually more likely to go slower and slower and slower. So the direct pathway is actually facilitating a slower movement. And similarly, if you stimulate the indirect pathway, it's like you're punishing a, slowing, a slow movement, and that actually facilitates uh, a faster movement. So they go faster and faster and faster. And then those effects hold uh, for a while. This is with no more stimulation, and then eventually they extinguish. So this is a nice study because it suggests that there is a reinforcement learning effect in the direct and indirect pathways and not just uh, a go versus no go. Good question. Here? Uh, it gets a reward when it presses the lever. And it wants the reward, and the stimulation in this experiment, if I remember right, was during the outcome. So during the, the outcome, after they did a slow movement, they then stimulated, and they either reinforced that movement to go faster or slower. So it always wants to press it, because that's how it gets its food. And it's just modulating how fast it does it. Um, and anyway, that's the, the study I chose to present here, but there's actually a bunch of others uh, using also sophisticated other rodent genetic engineering methods to really get at D1 versus D2 pathways and reinforcement learning and sort of surprisingly held up pretty well. Um, so if you look up Parkinson's disease on the web and you want to understand a little bit about what Parkinson's disease is, you know, this kind of symptoms that patients have, problems with gait and tremor and things like that. And to explain why you give Parkinson's patients medication, they usually will have a figure that looks something like this. Here's a normal neuron that releases dopamine, but then somehow directly facilitates movement. That's like the most simple model of a brain you might ever see, that there's a neuron that creates movement. Uh, and then here's a Parkinsonian neuron that doesn't make a lot of dopamine, and so you have movement disorders. And that's basically, even though it's meant to be a caricature, it's basically the way that people have thought about Parkinson's disease for a long time. But these models that are built on uh, reinforcement learning ideas from Reed and Peter and some of the models that we've done and, and a whole bunch of other people uh, and systems neuroscience suggest that dopamine is really not just about movement. It's about motivational incentive and how much you care about cost versus benefit and learning as well. Um, and so that might actually suggest something about Parkinson's disease that's a little bit different from, from this model. Uh, also, if you have too much dopamine in the basal ganglia, that can actually induce impulsivity. So some patients that are given dopamine medications get addicted to those medications. Some patients become pathological gamblers. Some patients become compulsive shoppers, and so forth. And there's a, a good review of this by Ellen Dagger and Trevor Robbins. Um, so in terms of Parkinson's disease, just briefly, um, you can do a rodent model again, where you take a rodent, uh, you give it dopamine depletion, either through 6-hydroxydopamine uh, lesion, or in this case, through uh, blocking the D2 receptor, so it's uh, haloperidol, a drug that's given to schizophrenia patients. Uh, and then you can measure how, you put the animal on a grid or a, a bar, and you measure how long does it take for them to get off that grid or bar, if they want to get off of it. So this is going to give you a continuous readout of sort of how fast an animal can move when they want to move. And so this is the descent latency, how quickly they get off. Uh, and you give them a sub-threshold dose so it has pretty much no effect on the first day. But if you continue to do this across days, the animal gets slower and slower and slower. So it's like accumulating this, what they call catalepsy sensitization. Uh, and then if you, uh, in this experiment, they change the context. So they put the animal in a different room, different experimenter and so forth. And you can see that 
they still express some amount of catalepsy, but it's much less. So it's as if they've learned something in that context. Uh, you can do all the right control experiments. You can give the animal the drug in their home cage, and you don't see this effect and so forth. Um, and then if you also, if you remove the haloperidol, you still see that the animals express it for a while, and then it extinguishes. So the question is, is this a case of exaggerated no-go learning? Is this actually a good model for what might happen in Parkinson's disease? You have low levels of dopamine, and even without further progression of dopamine damage, which we know there also is in Parkinson's disease, but even without that, you might actually learn to become more avoidant. Um, so one study that my colleague Jeff Beeler did uh, had a, uh, a really sophisticated set of motor skill learning tasks. I'm not going to go into all the details, but part of that he also did uh, a synaptic plasticity study. So he basically just recorded from D2 neurons in the striatum and recorded the, uh, this is excitatory postsynaptic current, so you can look at how much uh, the neuron is excitable. And you could do that uh, with sulfuride, which is a D2 blocker, or without it. And what you can see is that with sulfuride, the, the synaptic strength seems to go up with time. So you're actually increasing the strength of synapses to the cortex as uh, to just a single pulse. You're not doing any special LTP protocol, if you're familiar with those. Uh, and then you could block that by co-administering it with a, a drug that targets adenosine receptors, which are co-localized on D2 cells. And I'm, I'm not going to go into all the, the details of that. So this is suggesting one of the things that was predicted by uh, the model that, you know, negative prediction errors that give rise to more activity in the D2 cells, which is the same thing that would happen if you blocked D2 receptors, uh, lead to LTP. And maybe that's the mechanism for that sort of catalepsy sensitization I mentioned. Um, and so one of the set of experiments that Jeff did was now to do an active uh, motor skill learning test. So now the animal is, uh, is on an accelerating rotor rod, and it's just it's trying to stay on. And typically what you see in healthy animals is that their latency to fall off the rotor rod, so they're like actually running on this rod, goes up across, day, uh, across trials because they're, they're learning to do the task better. Uh, if you give a dopamine blocker, this is a cocktail of D1 and D2 blockers, the animal is really bad at the task. And that's not surprising because the, there's dopamine is blocked and the animal can't do a motor skill learning task. Um, but the interesting thing is that if you then wash out the drug and you make sure it's out of the system and so forth, you then look at those animals these are the same animals, and even their learning curve, they do eventually get up to the normal level, but they're much slower than the animals who had learned in the first place, and they're slower than other animals who had never experienced this phase. So th they're actually showing uh, what we think is aberrant learning. So during this phase, they're not only not acting, they're actually learning to do the wrong thing. They're learning to avoid actions. Um, and you see the same thing if you train the animals in the intact state with saline, but then you give them, uh, a, a, especially with a D2 blocker, uh, then they get worse right away, but they actually progressively get worse after that, and then they slowly recover. And that you can reproduce uh, all the patterns of this and separately for D1 and D2 blockade in the, the neural network model that I showed you before that assumes that there's uh, changes in plasticity resulting from D2 blockade. Um, so one thing we wanted to do is to leverage this model idea to say, well, let's target something that's a little bit more specific to the D2 pathway than just D2 receptors, because D2 receptors are also present in other parts of the brain. Uh, so we looked at candidate genes, and there's one called GPR6, which is a G protein coupled receptor. Uh, and this is the expression of it in post-mortem human uh, tissue. And this shows a cummins and putamen. So pretty much the striatum and nowhere else in the brain is this uh, receptor expressed. Uh, and then the mouse study suggests that it's present only in striatopalatal cells, which are the D2 receptors of the no-go pathway, and not striatonigral cells, which are the D1 receptors. Uh, what do we know about GRP, GPR6? Not that much, except that it does seem to upregulate all these things that are thought to be involved in synaptic plasticity. I'm not going to go through the details of the, mi of the biology. Uh, and so it's maybe a target that mediates, that's part of the, the cascade of events that leads to plasticity, leads to changes in learning that's present in D2 neurons. Uh, so my colleague Kevin Bath uh, at Brown got hold of these GPR6 knockout animals. Uh, and then we did the Jeff Beeler experiment where we did the rotor rod task. This is the healthy animals getting better at the task. And these are the animals that are on dopamine block blockers. In this case, uh, I think this is just a D2 blocker. Uh, and uh, you can see, just like before, the animals are bad at the task when they're on the dopamine blocker. And that's the same pretty much for the, the GPR6 knockout animals and the, the animals that don't have, that are wild type. The interesting thing is that when you remove the drug, uh, 
the, we replicate the Beeler effect where the wild type animal uh, who had the dopamine blockade before is really slow at learning. But the animal who does not have GPR6, which is supposed to be involved in learning in the D2 pathway, actually learns much faster. So we thought this is, these are intriguing. These are data that we haven't published yet, uh, but we have some analogous data in humans with GPR6 uh, candidate genes. Uh, and we think that that means that there's, based on this simple model idea, there might be a way of targeting symptoms of Parkinson's disease and also motor symptoms that develop in schizophrenia as a result of D2 receptors by going after a different uh, receptor that has been very understudied. Okay, so in humans, we look at this kind of learning through, uh, often we use probabilistic reinforcement learning tasks. So in this case, people are presented with stuff on the screen. These are different Japanese characters and they have to learn to choose one character and avoid choosing another one. And these numbers all just refer to the probability that they're gonna win or lose points that will translate to money in some of the experiments. So A has the highest probability of leading to reward. It has 80% chance of leading to reward and only 20% chance of leading to negative feedback. And B has a high chance of leading to negative feedback, 80% and 20% chance of leading to positive feedback. And then these other ones are just more probabilistic. So 70, 30, 60, 40. Uh, and so we think that you know, everybody should be able to learn to choose the easiest ones that choose A over B and C over D. Um, but the question is, do they learn that A is good or do they learn that B is bad? And those are not necessarily the same thing. And you can't tell by this learning phase very well because they're just choosing A and not choosing B. So we literally give them a test phase where we don't give them feedback anymore, but we just ask them to choose between A and all these other ones on separate trials, which have on average neutral 50% value. And we thought that if you're learning that A is good, if you're learning from rewards, then you would m consistently choose A over those guys. Whereas if you're learning that, if you primarily learn from negative feedback, you would actually more often avoid B when presented with those same neutral stimuli. So the only thing that's different in these different test pairs is the presence of A and B. Uh, and so standard reinforcement learning models that are not motivated by the biology of these op op opponent pathways actually predict no difference in performance here. But these models uh, that, predict that suggest that learning is separate do predict differences. Uh, what we see across many studies now is that these are uh, Parkinson's patients who are off medication. They are uh, pretty good at avoiding B, avoiding the negative one, but they're not as good at choosing A. But the same patients, if they're on their dopamine medication, actually show the opposite pattern of results. So they learn to choose A, but they're actually bad at avoiding B. And that is something that was simulated in our model as well, because if you elevate dopamine levels too much from a medication, it prevents these negative prediction errors from happening and you don't learn from negative feedback. So you're not using the brain's natural uh, regulation process. Uh, that effect has now been replicated by many labs uh, in this task and also other tasks. Uh, I think there's 15 papers that show that kind of effect. Um, and uh, we've also looked at it in PET imaging. So you could look at D1 and D2 binding in humans and healthy humans. And it turns out that individual differences in these two things are predicted by individual differences in D1 and D2 receptors. Uh, and we've also uh, looked at some genetics that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so here uh, we want to focus on a, a gene that re relates to uh, DARP32. So that's a uh, an intracellular protein that's concentrated in the striatum, uh, and it's been shown to have a differential effects on D1 versus D2 dependent plasticity. It actually won Paul Greengard the, the Nobel Prize in 2000 for uh, uncovering all the details of how DARP32 works in intracellular signaling cascades. Um, and so we thought that might be relevant for because it's related to plasticity and, and reward learning. Uh, and for fun, I thought another Nobel laureate, you might want to hear from him. This is going to surprise you, but Bob Dylan actually has some thoughts on DARP32. The Bob Dylan. That was really Bob Dylan. And uh, I'm a big Bob Dylan fan, uh, and that's probably my favorite Bob Dylan quote. So he, he talks about DARP32, the stradium. Uh, that was actually at a conference, uh, sorry, at a concert that had a theme to do with genius and madness and how they may be related to each other. 
And there was a paper that came out that showed that schizophrenia patients are more likely to have a form of the DARP32 gene that also correlates with good cognition in healthy people. So that's what he was sort of referring to. Um, but our model had a, a, a simpler prediction than Bob Dylan's, which is, which is essentially just that if this protein, if DARP32 is involved in the signaling path pathways of synaptic plasticity, it should actually predict different asymmetries in reinforcement learning in these kinds of tasks. Uh, and what we found, this is one study with an N of 80, which may be surprising to you that you can see a single gene effect in a sample of that size if you're used to like whole genome studies. But I can say that this is actually a replication of another study and we've shown this effect many times. Um, that uh, depending on the number of copies of the T allele of this DARP32 uh, single nucle nucleotide polymorphism, which affects the mRNA, the, am the amount of DARP32 that is expressed, uh, the asymmetry in choose A versus avoid B in that task, so learning from positive versus negative learning, is parametrically affected by this sort of gene dose response. Uh, and similarly, there's a gene that codes for the D2 receptors, the uh, affinity or the density of those receptors, not exactly understood that well, um, but something about the D2 receptors correlates uh, in a gene dose way with avoid B in particular. Yeah. Uh, we took 80 people, and then we sequenced all of them, and then we analyzed the data, and then split them by the genotype. So we choose polymorphisms that tend to be fairly well distributed, so that, uh, and we don't always get a perfect gene dose effect. So sometimes, two of the groups sort of cluster together, but it's, but we uh, we do replicate this effect many times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it, I mean, I'm not sure why it wouldn't it go. go the it should go the other way. Yeah. I don't. So. Oh, for sure. Okay. For sure. It's not. I mean, it's surprising that the effects are of this magnitude. Um, so the thing that makes me more comfortable that it's not just uh, how special. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you'll see a consistent effect. Although there's also complications because there's uh, racial and ethnic heterogeneity in in gene distributions, and so usually you have to do the analysis in the most homogeneous sample that you can have. So when we do it, we don't restrict who comes into the experiment, but then we always do an analysis afterwards that says, we look just in Caucasians, which is the, the largest group of our sample, we still see the effect. Because there is a possibility of, um, it's called occult stratification, that is the, if there's a difference across different groups in the proportion of receptors, of, of, of the genotypes, then maybe the difference is just due to something else that happens to correlate with that gene. And that still could be the truth here, the case here. It's not necessarily that our model of it really being DARP32 that matters. The thing that makes me more confident about it is that when we do dopamine manipulation studies, we get the same effect. So you get pharmacology that says at least it's, it seems like it's dopamine related. Uh, and the PET imaging studies also go with it. But there's de it's definitely the case that these are not the only factors that control the asymmetry. And it may be that for some reason they cluster together like a gene that controls the asymmetry here may also cluster together with other, let's say, functional connectivity markers that you could look at in fMRI that might predict it. I don't know. It is surprising that the effect is as clear as it is, but uh, I can say that for sure it replicates. I can't say for sure that it replicates for the reason we think it does. Okay, I, I only have a little bit of time, so I'm just going to switch gears a little bit just to say something other than um, positive and negative learning. We look at a lot of other constructs in my lab. Uh, and uh, so another, tr just to stay in the same rough theme though of impulsivity in Parkinson's disease, and one of the main treatments for Parkinson's in patients who don't respond well to dopamine medication uh, is deep brain stimulation of the subthalamic nucleus, which is part of the basal ganglia. It's like a pacemaker, but instead of stimulating the heart, it's implanted there. Uh, and uh, oh, usually I show videos, but I don't have a lot of time. Um, it's really obvious these patients, when you turn on their stimulation, 
they just get better. They turn them off, their tremor comes back, their faces get cold. It's like, it's not just something that you have, if you look on YouTube, you'll find amazing videos. If you look at any one patient and you bring them into the lab, it's almost just as amazing. It's really an amazing discovery that you can use a clinical procedure to improve symptoms of Parkinson's disease. But it's not perfect. It's pretty crude, right? You're stimulating at 150 hertz, four volts. There's gonna be huge, huge amounts of current spread. You don't know what cell types you're stimulating and so forth. Um, and so there's some side effects. Uh, this is an example of an email I got from somebody after I published a paper on DBS. It said, hi, I found your email address and I was reading about DBS surgery for Parkinson's. My dad had surgery last May and we have a mess on our hands. Two months following the surgery, we began to notice some personality changes. He became impulsive. Um, I'm gonna skip some of this. He was detail-oriented and now sloppy. He's spending a lot of money, not gone one day without buying something, can't sit still, always on the move. So this is by far not what you see in every patient, and if it gets this bad, they can usually reprogram the stimulators to make it, to reduce the symptoms. But it's also not just an anecdote. Uh, we know in the lab that DBS dramatically improves motor symptoms, but it can also induce impulsivity. It's been documented in their real world lives and also in some tasks, so I'll just give you a sense of that. So what's the mechanism for this and what sort of models can be useful? How does it relate to the, the kind of impulsivity I forgot to say that before, the patients that are on medication, they're more likely to gamble, I said that. That may relate to this asymmetry in learning from positive and negative outcomes, right? That might be one mechanism that would cause somebody to be impulsive. Uh, is this the same kind of impulsivity? Um, so for that, we want to go from reinforcement learning to uh, another construct that is about really decision-making related to conflict. So this is an example of, you know, the, these two donkeys that are trying to get bales of hay and they, neither of them can do it but one of them then realizes oh wait I can do something that's not the most impulsive thing which is just to go forward but I can just join my friend and then they both get to eat. Um, so how does that relate to the basal ganglia? So this is this complicated circuitry of the the go and no-go pathways through D1 and D2 receptors. Um, this other thing that I sort of left out is uh, what we think of as a, a third pathway rather than part of classically it was part of the indirect pathway. And the subthalamic nucleus gets direct input from the cortex. Uh, these are areas of the cortex, the dorsomedial frontal cortex that I'm emphasizing here that sends strong projections there according to monkey and human uh, anatomical data. Uh, and it sends diffuse excitatory outputs, uh, uh, signals to the output of the basal ganglia, which is itself suppressing the thalamus. So essentially, this is often thought of as sort of like a global no-go signal. It's diffusely just suppressing all actions. Uh, and so what we wanted to do is ask, well, if you take into account the dynamics of this area and the sort of cognitive computations, what is it doing? And so it turns out that these areas often get activated in conditions of uncertainty or conflict, and you're not sure what to do. And you can see that in the STN2, as I'll show you in a second. And roughly our model suggested that what that, path, what that does is it actually allows this sort of gating system that's looking at cost-benefit decision-making to be sensitive to how uncertain you are about what choice to make. And it gives a sort of what we call a hold your horses signal. It says, wait, take a little bit more time, figure out which option is really the best option to make. Uh, so if you look in monkey physiology data, here's this data on the right. This is in a task where a monkey uh, is preparing to move its eyes in one direction, but something comes up, a cue comes up that tells it, oh wait, to get your reward, you actually have to switch to the other direction. So it's sort of like a conflict kind of thing. Uh, and there you see this increase in subthalamic nucleus spiking. This is activity in the STN. And in blue is that same trial type, but the monkey sort of failed to switch their eyes and they went impulsively to the correct direction. And we can reproduce those electrophysiological patterns in our model. Um, but interestingly, you can look at how that pattern of physiology relates to behavior. So this is uh, the distribution of response time. So it's a histogram of the, how much time it took the monkey to move. And red is the case where the mon monkey correctly switched to move their eyes to the other location. And the main thing to see here is that when they're correct, which is the condition where the STN has this increase in activity, their response distribution is shifted to the right, so they're slower. Whereas when they are incorrect, they're faster, so they're sort of impulsively going the wrong way. That happens in our model too. We can also do response time distributions in the neural model, and that's because in the model, what the STN is doing is sort of what I said, this hold your horses mechanism. It's essentially raising what we call the decision threshold, which is a, a construct that comes from other models in mathematical psychology that says you need to integrate more evidence before you commit to a response. So as the STN goes up, you're more likely to be correct, but you're slower at doing so. Uh, and so if we run patients with Parkinson's disease on this 
uh, same probabilistic reward task, uh, but instead of doing it by choose A and avoid B, which is like the positive and negative thing, we can divide up the test trials into low conflict choices between, let's say, A and uh, I guess here would be D. So 80 versus 30 percent, that's an easy discrimination. You've never made it before because you've only learned about A and B together and so forth. Uh, you could quantify how uncertain you should be about that decision. It's not very much. Uh, and then there's a high conflict choice, which would be, let's say, A versus C, which have very similar reward values, and they're both high. So you might impulsively just choose whichever one you happen to look at first, unless you have a mechanism to prevent yourself from doing that. And the idea in the model is that you might need the STN to prevent those impulsive responses. Uh, there's some physiology from STN neurons in humans that are in the operating room performing this task. And you can see the spiking in the STN is higher in the high conflict than in the low conflict condition. And we've seen this as well uh, in the theta band, if you look at oscillations in the STN. Um, and so our first study to, to look at this in patients with Parkinson's disease was to put them on and off deep brain stimulation while they do the task. So first I'm showing uh, how much people slow their reaction times from low to high conflict. So positive values mean you're slower when, when you're presented with conflict. And these are healthy seniors, so age match controls. Uh, and you can see both when they're correct, meaning they chose the optimal stimulus, and when they're incorrect, people slow down by about 1 to 200 milliseconds. Uh, and that's true in Parkinson's patients, too. They slow down when they're not on DBS. But when you turn their DBS units on, not only do they not slow down, they actually speed up in these high conflict win-win conditions, uh, and especially when they make a mistake and they choose the, the sort of impulsive response to go to choose the wrong one. Um, and these effects are totally different than the effects that I described of dopamine medication on positive and negative learning. It's sort of a, a double dissociation. So we think that there are markers of different forms of impulsivity that you're trying to use models and uh, of underlying brain systems to, to be informed about. Um, for lack of time, I'm not going to go into some of the other evidence, but there's now also a bunch of studies in rodents that can manipulate the STN and show that it also it has this effect of sort of stopping behavior. Um, and Jim Cavanaugh did a follow-up study in Parkinson's patients, basically the same study but with uh, recordings in the STN and also uh, EEG recordings on the scalp. And just very quickly, what this study showed was that as people experience conflict in the task, you see signals of conflict in the medial frontal cortex in the theta band. So those are oscill slow oscillations at about 4 hertz. Uh, and those correlate with how slow you are when you're making a decision and also with your decision threshold if you estimate it from a, a computational model. So that essentially means more theta means you're slower but more accurate. Less theta, theta means you're faster but less accurate. Uh, and what he found was that relationship was, and you also see these theta signals, sorry, these are, these are recordings from the STN increases in theta power for high versus low conflict. And, and these signals are Granger causal of these signals, which make it look like these are driving those signals. Uh, but the interesting thing about this study, I thought, was that Parkinson's patients show these same theta signals when they experience conflict, even when they're on DBS. It doesn't affect the theta signal. What's different is that the relationship between this cortical signal of conflict and their decision threshold or their response time is actually reversed when you turn on the deep brain stimulation over here. So the idea is that in a crude way that we can do in humans, we can sort of prevent the STN from responding normally to its cortical inputs. We leave this signal intact, but we now uh, make the subject make an impulsive response because it's no longer able to use that signal to regulate their behavior. At least that's our interpretation. Um, and then we, yeah, we have some functional imaging data. Uh, so this would suggest, uh, you know, this is something that we haven't done yet, but uh, we'd like to do something like this, where we can use a decoder in real time to, to ask, is the person experiencing conflict? It may be theta, but it may be some more sophisticated signal. And then we could ask, well, if they're experiencing conflict and their cortex knows about it, maybe we could actually use that in a closed, pe uh, closed loop circuit so that instead of always applying deep brain stimulation in an open loop way, you'd actually respond in an adaptive way so that you would prevent the, the subject from making impulsive decisions while still uh, restoring its uh, normal movement. It's easier said than done. Um, OK, I'm going to move on just to the summary uh, that I said was dopamine uh, modulates learning. And you have, I think, pretty good evidence about, uh, of that across species and labs. Uh, cost versus benefit decision making, so it's not just the learning part. And I haven't talked too much about that, but I'm happy to. <coughs> 
Uh, and that there's this other pathway in the basal ganglia that sort of regulates the striatal reward system from making responses by saying you take a little bit more time to sort of integrate how much reward is expected and adjust the decision threshold. These mechanisms are dissociable and their disruption may lead to distinct types of impulsivity. Uh, and then what I didn't mention is that we also look at hierarchical interactions among multiple frontal striatal circuits for more sophisticated uh, task structure learning and other kinds of decision making that supports generalization. Um, so with that, I better thank uh, all of my collaborators and funders. Of course, I didn't do this work myself. Most of it was done by other people. And thank you very much. Well, I, I, yeah, those are, are two separate things. I mean, I agree with you, that's, that's, a, that's a problem. Um, but the, the thing I was referring to that easier said than done in the closed loop simulation is there's all sorts of challenges to get the decoder to work online, but also to then affect DBS parameters in real time, which even if you get it to work right away, the physiological neuron, if it's been stimulated at high frequency for the last several minutes, turning off the stimulation, for example, for 100 milliseconds might not have any effect. It might take a while. Right? So that's like just, I, I don't know how much that's a limit. Uh, but in general, um, yeah, so our initial uh, study, for example, um, this one, what we did is we fit a model that estimated the, the decision threshold. Uh, and we showed that when patients are on stimulation as a group, their decision threshold goes down. And the relationship between theta power and their decision threshold goes down. But that's a conclusion, that's like a traditional way of doing an experiment compared to groups. In psychiatry and, and neurology, often we want to make things, conclusions about individuals. So uh, Thomas Wicke, who was a grad student in my lab, did, uh, took this sa these same data and took the model parameters fit to the patient, e each individual patient, and put it into a classifier. So the model parameters from the drift diffusion model and the theta regressor onto those parameters. And then asked, how much can you predict about whether the person is on or off DBS? which in that case we know because we turn them on or off DBS. Uh, and it turns out that it's a, that's another good example of if you just do it based on their raw behavior, you can get above chance. But if you do it based on the model parameter, and especially the, the only parameters that matter were the decision threshold and the theta modulation of the decision threshold, then you, I think it was like 85% accurate. Um, now that's, that's good, but it doesn't really matter that much because we know the person is on DBS, but the idea is if we can use the models to identify whether someone has a disruption in that mechanism, then maybe someone with ADHD has that form of impulsivity that acts on that circuit, and we could use that as a way of, of saying, well, maybe they're going to benefit more from a drug that might act on, that be, might be more likely to act on that pathway than a drug that acts in the striatum, for example. Yeah. The, yeah, so I mentioned that because actually that same student that I just mentioned, Thomas Wicke, we have one paper with a Huntington's group where we had 400 Huntington's patients or so uh, and 400 controls. And we had pre-symptomatic patients and, and post-symptomatic patients. And they ran, they had done an anti-saccade task, so you look one way, you have to look the other way. And he fit a, a, a model that's sort of like a drift diffusion model. But, um, and uh, he was able to predict a little bit better than just the clinical scores, whether when they were going to, uh, well, he was able to separate, very easy to separate the symptomatic patients from controls. You just have to look at the data with your eyeballs, you know. But the, the pre-symptomatic patients look mostly like controls. The models allow you to discriminate them. Uh, it was not 85% accuracy. I think it was more like 60 something. Uh, and the model predictions were better for those sim subjects that then later converted more uh, sooner, which may be useful even in that case, you know, we know they're going to get Huntington's disease, but clinically, if you can do better than that, it might help you decide when to medicate because there are also side effects of medication. So, yeah, but that's, the hope is that we can do better than 60% uh, if we had better measures and, and other, let's say, imaging measures, but that's the general strategy. 
All right. Thank you.